haven't met, I am Pastor James, and very excited that you've chosen to share your Labor Day with us. I know this is a great weekend, and oftentimes we are able to get away. Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Now, you just sang it, so I know you're familiar with it, okay? So, you ready? Amen. We are talking... Uh, about uh, a particular fra- uh, particular uh, verses that Jesus was speaking to an audience. So this was to a group of people. It wasn't just to the disciples. It was to the group of people. And he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body and what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, and what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Well, all of our lives are in this sort of constant change, right? We are going, uh, we are we're going through seasons. Uh, we have changing circumstances in our lives. We even have uh, our own personal development, right? Where where we're improving, hopefully. And uh, there's things. All the, we have all these seasons of change, and all these changes usher in a new context by which we experience God's word, what we call the Bible. It, we every circumstance and every change causes us to experience the Bible in a new way. And it remains alive to us today as much as it did when, when these scriptures, scriptures were written at the time the, the, in the first century when the Gospels were written. And so all these words are alive to us today as they were then. And so we're excited to start in this new sermon series on some of the harder sayings of Jesus, okay? And it's, it's uh, we're gonna talk about some of the harder sayings that he gave and how we're gonna receive those ourselves today because the word is alive. These sayings were so profound that the gospel writers captured them, right? This, these were, this was something unusual. This was something uh, special that was being captured here. So much so that they often stand alone in this, in a different passage. So like in this case, that's the, that's the whole thing he was talking about. And the, and the gospel writers were thought it was so important that we capture all. But what's beyond all of this there is this un- understandable and uh, inescapable truth that this word is alive for us today and it represents what we and the sayings of Jesus that all generations have experienced and have to somewhat wrestle with. We have to, what we have to talk about. So that's what our sermon series is called. That's what he said. Okay, so this is what he said. And that's what, that's what we're approaching today. So in our world today, there are books written about all the things that Jesus said and, and the circumstances and, and even on our, the thing today on do not worry, right? He's, there's, there's books and interpretations out there and, and people will say like, this is, a, this is a new teaching and a new perspective, but, but ultimately it's, it's the same. Right? It's, it's the same words as that were written in the time of Christ. 
It's just we have a context that we need to understand them today. So we, we have to look at our changing context and understand the word and how it's being interacting with us today. How are we applying it? How are we living it out in our lives today? And our hope is, as we're going through these different difficult sayings of Christ, that you'll be challenged in your thinking and maybe in your attitudes or maybe in the certain areas of your life that maybe you thought this was addressed already, but God's speaking to you in a new way and asking for you to reconsider it, to hear it anew, to hear it like you've never heard it before and see that if our attitudes and our desires and all that align with what scripture is calling into our lives, what scripture wants us to be aligned with. So, and hopefully if it's not, then it's creating a spiritual change for each one of us. Okay, in our scripture reading this morning, the teaching from Jesus begins with, do not worry about your life. Now, that doesn't seem like such a difficult saying of Christ, right? I, I don't know about you, but it doesn't, at the forefront, it's not one of those things I'm like, oh, I guess I don't need to wrestle with that. But what he's saying here isn't that you should be given to some kind of fantasy to be divorced from reality in some way and plunge headlong into life without a care in the world, right? He's, he's not saying that. But it is such a profound teaching that it's captured in actually both of two of the Gospels, uh, Matthew and Luke, that this was something important that Jesus was telling them. Let's pick up again in verse 26. And he says, look at the birds of the air that they do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass, grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? This first portion of the scripture, Jesus is talking to the audience to tell them that God cares for them. Now, if we pause for just a moment and realize that this audience needed to hear that God cared for them, that God cares about the details of their lives, about the, the very circumstances that they're living in, we realize that this is a really profound saying that Christ gave to those people. They needed to hear this, these words. Why? Well, it's difficult to say this was a largely preliterate society, but we know they were under Roman occupation that they, they suffered with these Roman overlords, that the Herods were awful kings, and that were their regional kingdoms, that they, were, they had all this opulence that they were building, and yet the average person wasn't experiencing that. They still went to the well to draw water. They still lived in a world where the rich and the poor were pretty far apart, and there's no social security. There's no backup plan for when everything fails. So I think Jesus, these people needed to hear from Christ that God cares very much for the, very, for your, for the details of your life. He reminds us in verse 34 that our life's not going to be without trouble. He's not saying that. But what he is saying is that God deeply cares about each one of us. Now, I think if we were living in the circumstances of that century when this book was written, we might have needed to be reminded that God deeply cares for us. I also think that even today sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we need to be reminded sometimes that God really 
cares for us, cares about us, the depths of us, and sometimes we need to hear those words for ourselves, just like that audience did. I think he cares for us so much that he doesn't want us to be influenced by this idea of worry. Did worrying add even an hour to your life? I think he wanted us to be focused on the fact that he deeply cares for us. Secondly, I think Jesus leads us to another really important point in verses 31 through 33. He says, so do not worry about, do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you. See, Jesus is saying, don't chase after clothing. I know it sounds kind of funny, but clothing in that, in that time represented status. If you had very nice clothes, you know, that was, that was something to be admired, right? That was... you. That was a status symbol. He's saying don't chase after the things that are, that make you feel special because of clothing made you feel secure and how you looked or how people perceived you, how people, how people thought of you. He's saying don't chase after that thing. He's saying don't chase after the, the food, which, you know, we we realize food is part of our daily sustenance. We just got done praying for our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It's something he knows we need, but it doesn't, it, it just allows us to say, yeah, it's something we need. We don't have to pursue this building up of the storehouse, as he called them, or barns, filling up their barns, right? He's saying, I know you need this. Don't pursue that. And don't pursue this unknown future the thing that you can't see, you can't predict, don't, don't keep chasing after those things because that's what the pagans do. They're chasing after all these things. And the pagans were basically the non-religious, right? The people that, that, weren't, uh, that weren't Jews, they were, they, were, uh, they were the opposite of religious, right? They were just chasing after life and, and, uh, and trying to live it uh, in a way that, that wasn't glorifying to God. He said, don't, don't do that. That's what they do. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You see, God doesn't want us distracted pursuing the things that are keeping us from pursuing his kingdom and his righteousness. The things of these, this world, the things of these, the world that, that the pagans are chasing, the, the affirmation that they're chasing, don't be distracted by those things. Be, be diligent about pursuing the kingdom of God and seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But you could have read this scripture passage this morning and not needed me to interpret any of that for you. You can read God's word and it it will speak to you. you. You have all of that. So, but our sermon series is on taking on a new perspective. How do we see that today? How does this relate to my context today? What do I even mean by context? I've been using this word for a long time now. Like, well, for example, context is is how what we're experiencing today. So for me, I'm a father and a husband, and we're empty nesters, and we're kind of re-nesting, but we're soon to be empty nesters again. Uh, but you know, it's like uh, I'm bivocational, and uh, Lynette's trying to figure out how to do retirement, but she's not being very successful yet. Uh, but you know, it's just, that's our context, right? That's how we're experiencing the world today. That's how we're experiencing life. This is our context. And, and our, the scripture today is how do we interpret, how do we receive God's word today? Your context may well be like who Jesus was speaking to. Like, hey, you know what? I just want a paycheck that lets me go from week to week without the bank account going to zero. That's, that's my context. I need, I need God to be Jireh. I need him to be Jehovah Jireh, my provider, because, you know, it's, it's a struggle. That may be your context. 
So when you receive the word from God, when you receive, uh, read the word and receive that, that's your context. That's how you're processing it. Or maybe money's not your problem. Maybe you're dealing with an illness. Time is your problem. You know, like, or what, how you're going to feel tomorrow is your problem. Right? That's your context. And so each one of us are in these changing contexts of our lives that are, that are progressing and going on and on. And it's important that we understand kind of where we're coming from and how we're hearing the word of God. How do I seek now the kingdom of God in my context? Okay, Jesus told us something that John the Baptist told us. The first step about experiencing the kingdom of God is to repent. And repent just means to turn away, to turn in a new direction. Turn away from where you're going and turn towards God. That's, that's really all repentant means. But it means we turn away from maybe attitudes or desires or values that are of this world that set themselves up against God's kingdom, that set, them up, that set themselves up against God's values, what God wants. Think about the meaning of baptism for a minute, right? John the Baptist was baptizing in the River Jordan, which was no small feat to go down to below sea level to get to the River Jordan from Jerusalem or some of the surrounding areas. This was no small feat. You had to, climb, you had to go down a pretty steep terrain to get there. But when you got there, people would, were coming out of these towns and cities going to see John the Baptist, and he was saying, repent, for the kingdom of God was near. He's saying, reject the worldly values that you're living in and those contexts that are keeping you from God. Repent from that and be baptized and, re- and turn towards God in new life. So the, the, our baptism today, we, we take you down under water. Often, oftentimes, when we do immersion baptism, you're underwater, and that represents a death, right? That represents, like, you can't stay underwater, right? That's not going to, you're not going to last, right? So, but that represents a death and then a bring up into new life. And that comes because we repent of what we, were, what we were before and we want the new life that comes from Christ, that comes from God. And so Jesus even experienced this in his actual death, right? In his actual death, in his actual resurrection is a, re- is a baptism, is, a, is a, a, a new life. And that new life is what we get to experience because he gave his life for us. And that's, that's, what we, that's what we come to communion for, is to be reminded that we have new life. Every day is our, is our new day. You know, we celebrate Easter as resurrection day. Every day is our resurrection day because of what Christ did. And so we are reminded that in our, in our context, Jesus taught us that we need to repent from our old life to experience the kingdom of God in our new life. Okay, so in reference to this scripture passage this morning, are we worrying about how we're perceived, about what what people think of us, how we're liked, or how we're valued instead or in exchange for what God says about us and how he cares for us when he said in the scripture this morning aren't we more precious than these do we care about the likes or the thumbs up we get on instagram or facebook or the 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 the, how people see us more than the value of the kingdom of god more than working on our own integrity and what we are like inside I guess it boils down to if we have a if we have a life, we our life it's represented and in the center of our life is a throne and, and whatever's on that throne is what we're serving. Oftentimes, before we knew Christ, we were certainly 
ourselves were on the throne of our lives. We were the most important thing going. And we chose to pursue the things that made us happy, that, made, uh, that we felt like made us. And when we receive Christ, we step off the throne and we allow him to be on the throne of our lives so that our, our activities and our actions are focused about, around what he desires, what God wants for us. So we gotta make sure that we are not distracted by the things of this world that keeps us from pursuing God's kingdom come on this earth. We just prayed it this morning, thy kingdom come on earth. We want God's values here. We want to experience things that, that God wants us to experience. See, Jesus was challenging the people at this, in this moment, this audience, to be careful that their pursuits weren't distracting them from receiving the kingdom of God on this earth and to receiving his righteousness. I think even as a church, we often can get focused on being attractional. We can get focused on uh, wanting people to feel welcomed, which we do. We want pe people to feel comfortable coming in here. We want, we want people to experience Christ. We want people to know him. But it all comes through an act of repentance that we then experience Christ, right? We have to reject the sin that's in us, ask God to forgive us of that, to cleanse us, and then we have a relationship with Christ. See, oftentimes I think we, we just get focused on that we, we just want you to come and experience Christ. And yeah, experiencing Christ is great, but at some point we have a call to repentance. We have a call to, to testify about God's goodness. We have a call to be baptized and be dead in our own life. And when we come out, we're telling everyone, I'm a follower of Jesus now. I'm dead to my old self. I am a follower of Christ now. Well, I'm a person who likes to make New Year's resolutions. I like to do uh, every year. It's like, uh, okay, I want to... I want to lose some weight, okay. I want to uh, stop eating so much junk food. Uh, you know, just sort of self-improvement things. And, and, but also every year I, I pray and I ask God, you know, well, what is it this year that you want from me? Like, what is, what is our theme for the year? And a couple years ago, I was, I was praying that and saying, I was praying like, what do you want from our church and what do you want from me? And I really felt very convinced. He, he just said, I want, to, I want you and I want us to get good at repentance. And remember, repentance is, is just turning away. It shouldn't be a struggle for us to turn away from the things of the world, right? That should be, it should be something that's easy. Now, it's easy in here, in these four walls. We have this supernatural force field keeping the world outside, right? That uh, the, it can't penetrate these four walls. But you're going to leave here... And then you're going to go into the world and you're going to be experiencing the world for yourself. See, God wants us to have that, that sense of repentance that, look, if we're going in this direction, and it's like, whoa, whoa, I don't like where that's going. Let's go this way, right? I just got that one wrong, right? That's all repentance is. It's that, it's that simple, right? He just wants us to say, okay, this is, this, I was going this direction, but then, you know, this worldly, these worldly values are kind of messing me up. I, I don't want to go that way anymore. I, want to, I just want to turn and go, I want to pursue God. That, that's all repentance is. And he, I think he wants us to be good at it. So we have this stigma in our head that we're all walking around like some pious churchgoers. And we just, we're so good and we're, we're trying to be so good. You know, we're, that's not what we are. We're just... We're just doing the best we can most of the time, right? We're just, we're trying to make it through this life and, and be a good testimony to Jesus. But that just means we're, we need to be good at just saying, yeah, I got it wrong. Sorry, got that one wrong. It, do it, try, gonna try to do it right. I wanna do it right. It's in my heart to do it right. I wanna pursue God's kingdom come on this earth. I wanna get it right. And so I think we need to be good at repentance. I think we need to be, it needs to be fluid. 
I think it needs to be something like, just like we prayed, Lord, forgive us our trespasses. That easy. Like, just that fast, that easy. And we need, it just needs to be a fluid thing where we're able to just say, whoa, okay, wrong direction, no problem. Go in the right direction now. Just that, it's gotta be that easy for us. I think the gospel writer John says it well. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I think Christ's calling to repentance Repent for the kingdom of God. I don't think it's burdensome. I don't think it's something that we need to like sit sit down and like, oh, just lament and, you know, give ourselves, punish ourselves in some way. I don't think that's what God wants at all. I think he just wants us to be fluid. Just say, yep, Lord, thank you for forgiving me and cleansing me. Got this one wrong. I'm going to do this the next one right. And that it's something that we should just be in a constant dialogue with God about. We don't need to... Babylon as the pagans do, as he says, right? We don't need to do that. Just, just move on. Okay, the second leading I think Christ was talking to the audience, he was saying, uh, was for us to seek God's righteousness, right? Now, Jesus spoke really prolifically in the New Testament, especially in the four Gospels, about the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And so... Uh, we, he's calling us to pursue it, but, but because we're pursuing it, we're pursuing it in a way that was different than the church at the time, right? This was one of the things that he, was, he, was, he kept reminding them of. The, the church leaders or the, the Pharisees uh, would, would, uh, were so obsessed with doing it perfectly doing this law that started with 10 commandments that evolved into over 600 commandments, they were so obsessed with the doing it perfectly that, that they would forget. They were distracted with the law and being perfect to the law that they forgot what they were really there for was to seek God's kingdom and to seek God's righteousness, not their righteousness, but God's righteousness. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus talks to them. This is the seven, the part of the scriptures that are, it's called the seven woes. And these are, these are things he's talking to the church. He's talking to the church at the time. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. See, God wants us to reject those things of the world that are distracting us, that are keeping us from pursuing God's righteousness, his righteousness, what he desires, the, the, the values that he has. He he wants us to be pursuing that and he wants to stand he wants us to stand against anything that is interfering with us doing that. God wants us to, his righteousness is mercy and justice and faithfulness, right? That's God's righteousness. Not I I gave a tenth of even my spices. That's that's not what he's asking. And so he's saying you 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 blind guides, you just got so obsessed with this one thing that you had control over that you neglected the thing that you needed to be doing. And so he's telling us, don't get distracted with the world from pursuing God's righteousness. Well, what does that look like? How would that inhibit us how would that inhibit our righteousness, how we're pursuing righteousness? I mean, if you meet with your friends or colleagues or work, you should have a testimony in your life that, man, there's something going on. There's something different about this person. And do those people see the difference going on in a person or do they just see a reflection of themselves? I can't tell you, I've, I've had times where people were like, they come up to me like, I didn't know you were a Christian. I'm like, oh, really? I try so hard. <laughs> Couldn't give me a, a little bit? So then we, they're a Christian, right? So then we start talking. It's like, 
<sighs> okay. But, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's just a thing they say. But, uh, you know, it's, it, that's, that would be it, right? It's like somebody come up to you like, oh, my gosh, you're a Christian? I had no idea. <laughs> right? That would be a little bit, okay, well, I guess I'm not doing it quite right yet. And maybe there, there's something that needs to change. So to be a Christ follower means we're going to be living differently, that we're going to look different than everybody else, that we're going to be pursuing righteousness, not just the things that the world tells us that, that we should be pursuing. First Peter 2.9 says, uh, the, the head of the church of Jerusalem, Peter, wrote this. He said, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are God's special possession. We should look different. We should act different. Well, in order to recognize the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come. We have to immerse ourselves in the word of God. Jesus talks about it. It's all here. We have to immerse ourselves in it, in our context today. With this changing, you may have read it, you may have read it 50 times. But because your life is changing and your context is changing and how you're receiving it, you need to read it anew and just immerse yourself in the kingdom of God, in the in the Bible, so that we we know what the values of God are like, we know what God's righteousness looks like, and that we can be we can put that in our lives. We, I call it appropriate, but there's we can live it out in how we how we live out our lives, doing what God desires, making God pleased. That's what we choose to live out in the word by living out in the word, living in the word of God. As we learn of God's desires, we need to stand against those things which are distractions that would keep us going in the wrong direction, and just repent of that. Turn away and go to the go the go the direction that God's leading you. It should just be easy, and we need to be mindful that the cares of this world can distract us from living out the calling that God has for us. His final verse, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those other things that will be added unto you. So this morning as we begin, our, begin to close, I just want to open up this opportunity. If you felt like, you know, you just have a hard time saying, you know, I was wrong, I hate admitting I'm wrong, or you just have a hard time apologizing and moving on. I just want to encourage you. This should just be fluid. It should just be something that, Lord, forgive us our trespasses. It should be something that we just, are, it's so easy for us because we know he forgives us and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The Bible even says he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. So we no longer have to live in that sin. And so, we have that, we have a justifying God. So let's, let's get good at repentance. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Lord, today we are thankful that as in reading your scripture, we can see, Lord, that each one of us can approach your word in a new way. In every context, in every season of our life, in every changing circumstance, Lord, we can see you in a new way. So Lord, this morning, I just, I just pray for each person here that if they struggle with just saying, I want to go a new direction, this isn't where I wanted to go, Lord, I just pray that they would be released from any kind of bondage or feeling of inadequacy or, or uh, just you're, you love them, you're proud of us, Lord. You're, we are your special possession. Lord, I just pray against anything that would set itself up against that knowledge that you've got it. You've got this and we can rely on you. So Lord, this morning, I just, I just ask that each person here would be experiencing you in a new way, that, you, that your kingdom would come and that your righteousness would be seen 
And Lord, that we would pursue that with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, and with all of our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to uh, sing our final song. And as we do, I want to invite you to bring your tithes and offerings and your connection cards uh, to the baskets. And this is a time where we actually are, we're celebrating the goodness that God's done for us. And we're, we're, uh, we're just being a time of celebration. So would you stand and join me as we sing together? <laughs>